ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, we are presenting today the uh, um, uh, World Association of PPP Units and PPP Professionals, which is a Geneva-based global independent non-governmental organization. It aims to establish international network of PPP units and PPP practitioners involved in design and implementation of uh, PPP projects. So the question why we organize in this webinar today, um, the members of the health chapter, they um, ask for concrete examples of real case studies, how the PPP and healthcare were implemented. And we saw that Bentico PPP Hospital is really a success story, which demonstrates value for money, community-based approach, innovations, and sustainability experts. And therefore, we would like to start this series of uh, webinars really from this incredible project. So we are very fortunate today to have a very distinguished panel, well-known experts in the industry, representing key stakeholders in this project, public and private partners. And let me briefly introduce them in the order of speaking. So I will start with uh, Peter Faulkner, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Bendiger Health. And he is the ultimate beneficiary of uh, this uh, PPP project. Peter has worked in a variety of clinical and managerial roles within Victoria Public Health Services. In uh, the 80s, he worked as an advisor to the Victorian Minister for Health on psychiatric services and industrial relation matters. For the past 20 years, he has worked in executive management roles within acute hospitals. And for the past 11 and a half years, he has worked in a number of roles and Bendigo Health, including responsibility for the new Bendigo Hospital and having the role of CEO for the last three years. Welcome, Peter. Um, next is uh, Tony Michel. Uh, representative of the uh, government uh, and in his current role as the executive director delivery within the Victorian Health Building Authority. Tony has procurement, design, construction and commissioning delivery accountability for the Victorian government, currently 7 billion um, Australian dollars health infrastructure program and portfolio management responsibility. Prior to this role, Tony was contracted by the Victorian government to lead as a project director a number of PPP projects, including uh, 300 million Royal Women Hospital, 1.5 billion Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Center, and uh, the new Bendigo Hospital that we will be talking about. Uh, Tony, we are very happy to have you with us today. Um, by the way, I would like to say that we are also very lucky today because we have a gender uh, equality on our panel. We have a really uh, professional, competent, senior uh, women professional today. And I'm very happy to introduce Kerstin Schmidt, who is the senior investment manager responsible for equity in Siemens Financial Services. And she will be representing the investor uh, perspective to us. And Kerstin accumulated over the 20 years of working experience in finance and uh, developing infrastructure projects, uh, include, which include hospital, airports, rail, and other sectors. And uh, Kerstin was the project lead and uh, project company representative and board member for the successful Australian healthcare PPP Bendigo Hospital and also Sunshine University Hospital. Welcome, Kerstin. Uh, I'm also very happy to introduce Cameron Marcucho, Head of Enterprise Services and Solutions, Australia and New Zealand from Siemens Health Years. And Cameron has 25 years healthcare experience and he joined Siemens in 1998. And his achievements include structuring and managing successful sales and marketing teams and exceeding the business growth targets, improving the customer satisfaction. 
And Cameron's experience in Siemens PPP projects includes uh, PPP projects like Bendigo um, Hospital, Royal Children Hospital, Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Center, New Royal Adelaide Hospital, and Fiona Stanley Hospital. Cameron holds the Bachelor of Applied Science in Medical uh, Radiations from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Cameron, we're very much looking forward to your presentation today. And last but not least, another extre extremely um, well-known, distinguished uh, lady, um, the uh, professional Claire Chiu, CEO of Exemplar Health. And I'm very pleased to, that Claire has the uh, opportunity to join us today. Claire leads the consortium engaged by the Victorian state government to design, build, finance, operate, and maintain the Bendiga Hospital project. She is a highly experienced infrastructure delivery leader with over than 20 years of experience in successful management of some Victoria's most high profile and complex health and justice projects, including hospital courts and correctional facilities. Recent projects include the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Center, Hopkins Correctional Center PPP, and Partnerships Victoria Correctional Facility Project. Thank you, Claire, for being with us, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Yep. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, I would, without further ado, would like to um, give the floor to Peter Faulkner. Peter, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here and to uh, join with um, uh, my colleagues and uh, friends from uh, our um, terrific project, but also um, uh, to be joining you from so many parts of the uh, globe. So I think for many of you, it's good morning. For some, it may be good afternoon. And for us, it's good evening. Bendigo Health is the largest public health care provider in the Loddon Mallee region, servicing a catchment of 300,000 people. Located in the cosmopolitan regional centre of Bendigo, a progressive city with 100,000 residents that is projected to double in size by 2050. The hospital was built to meet the needs of this growing city for decades to come and was designed in partnership with the clinical staff who work there. A tranquil and healing environment, this iconic building is surrounded by gardens and features courtyards and balconies to give patients and staff access to natural light. Bendigo Health employs more than 4,500 staff and runs education for clinical staff, including medical staff in training and graduate nurses. Some of these staff will rotate back to Metro hospitals. The new Bendigo Hospital is part of a $630 million state government investment. The project was undertaken as a public-private partnership that had a total spend of more than $1 billion. Uh, you've got to love technology. Um, uh, I didn't have audio. I trust uh, some may have, some didn't have. But um, uh, without audio, hopefully some of the images uh, conveyed a few of the facets of the project that I will uh, discuss. Um, in those first uh, couple of images, there was a map of Victoria and um, a little highlight of what is the Loddon Mallee region. And uh, Bendigo uh, Health and the hospital that uh, was constructed through the PPP project is the regional public hospital servicing that Loddon Mallee region, which represents around 25% of our state's uh, land mass. 
services a population of around um, uh, 300,000 people and a very rapidly growing uh, population. Um, but we also provide uh, services across that entire region, not just in the uh, provincial city of uh, Bendigo itself, which has a population of about 100 uh, plus thousand people. Um, we provide regional uh, psychiatric services uh, across that entire geography. We have a, a broad array of community and continuing care services. We have a large uh, aged care, residential aged care, nursing home, uh, care type uh, services. Um, we employ as an organisation in excess of uh, 4,500 staff with a, a half a billion, uh, more than half a billion dollars Australian uh, dollar annual turnover. Uh, and prior to the new hospital, we had uh, very suboptimal facilities that were you know, just not safe in contemporary uh, uh, standards or context. Uh, we were squeezed into undersized buildings that were really not fit for purpose or certainly not fit for a digital uh, future. Um, I had the, uh, I suppose, uh, pleasure of working in those facilities. So um, I knew them quite uh, well and uh, had a fair idea of um, why they didn't work and what we needed to provide a good contemporary um, uh, health service to our community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we set out uh, from the beginning of the project to establish some requirements for, uh, for what we were seeking. We really wanted world-class facilities that would stand the test of time. And we did our own international research and uh, study tours to find out what world-class really was. Um, we needed expanded capacity, including uh, the development of a regional cancer centre to accommodate increasing demands. And if I think about the old hospital, we had our um, uh, chemotherapy service at one end of the site and our, um, our radiotherapy service at the other end of the site. And there was about... Um, I suppose half a kilometre distance between the two elements of the cancer service. So we really needed to join those up into a regional cancer centre. We wanted to reduce our environmental footprint and really produce a future ready facility. Um, and one that facilitated uh, through its design, uh, multidisciplinary clinical care models. Um, we wanted to create an academic precinct. We have two universities uh, within our precinct on our site and um, uh, both uh, uh, one doing medical, uh, essentially medical training and the other doing nursing and allied health training. So we really wanted to create a vibrant academic learning and research precinct. Uh, we needed to integrate uh, the continued use of a number of retained buildings the Bendigo Hospital site, um, Bendigo has, uh, the hospital has occupied the site we are on for 160 years. And anyone familiar with um, uh, hospitals knows that over that time, they grow, they um, uh, get, um, bits get demolished, new bits get built, um, but they're not always quite functional. But we needed to integrate some of those retained buildings and we wanted to do that in a functional way. We wanted a solid and strong investment in uh, ICT in uh, information communications technologies. Uh, and we wanted an environment that was accessible, that it was light uh, and that uh, offered landscape views from every inpatient room. So it was a bit of a challenge for the architects and the designers, but we were pretty clear about what we needed. Next slide, thanks. So the um, uh, approach that was adopted was a public-private partnership uh, development at the, uh, it was the largest regional hospital development in Victoria. 
And um, it was, as I've touched, a brown field project. So it was quite complex in terms of the uh, staging and construction uh, um, program and did require a substantial enabling works program. And for example, we had to demolish the existing kitchen servicing the hospital to build uh, the new hospital on that site. Uh, so that just created a bit of a challenge for, um, for the builder and for uh, uh, Exemplar Health and uh, the state. We also have a number of heritage buildings on the site. Some of those buildings are um, you know, well over 100 years old and had uh, historic relevance and value. So there was a program of redevelopment, refurbishment, and repurposing. Um, there was a lot of demolition that was integral to the program. We took it through two stages of design. And this particular, the Bendigo Hospital PPP, uh, um, saw the most extensive soft services of all Victorian hospitals. So we um, transferred a whole lot of uh, services into the PPP. Um, it was scheduled for completion uh, on uh, 14th of December uh, 2016, the construction and uh, commercial acceptance on uh, in January of 2017. It was really pleasing that those dates were in fact met. Next slide, thank you. Um, there were some commercial developments, which were some real value adds to the Benigo community and to our hospital community. Uh, there was a childcare centre that was delivered in the first stage of the program. Uh, a 128 room four star hotel delivered on the hospital in the hospital precinct, uh, a new construction um, and a number of retail in hospital food and other sympathetic uh, outlets and a wellness center. And um, uh, earlier today, I had the pleasure of, um, of uh, attending our wellness center and receiving um, uh, a generous um, uh, a philanthropic donation towards the operations of the wellness center from a uh, um, uh, Kirkland Lake Gold. Um, Bendigo was built on gold mining and uh, 150 years later, it's still going strong. And um, our first hospital was called the Diggers Hospital and it was really great to see uh, gold miners making a, a philanthropic contribution to our, our wellness center today. In the second stage of the project, um, there's the delivery of a conference center uh, and re retail pharmacy, and that's um, uh, well and truly uh, up and running and has been a part of uh, Bendigo's uh, vaccination effort for COVID, which has been terrific. Uh, next slide, thanks. Um, the partnership itself um, was governed by the project agreement, which um, uh, we know and love very well, all 2,200 pages of the, um, of the contract, um, the 31 schedules, the nine and next years, um, but it defined the formal interface structure, the meetings, the processes, communication protocols, et cetera. Uh, and it covers the um, uh, term of the partnership, which is a 27 year term, two years with design and construction, overlapping with a 25 year operating term. Uh, that's a contract between Exemplar Health and the state government. And um, no doubt, um, uh, Claire will uh, touch a little on that. And Bendigo Health is appointed as the hospital operator. So we have certain rights and obligations under, under the contract, but I'm really pleased to say, and I think the most important thing which really emphasises the notion of partnership is that it's not real often that we need to refer to the contract. Um, we know it exists, it serves a purpose, but it's really the partnership of people that have made our, um, our project so successful. Uh, next slide, thanks. Uh, these have been the um, key partners. Exemplar Health is the uh, consortium, Capella Capital, uh, and Siemens have been uh, financing uh, as well as uh, providing uh, some um, medical technology into the facility. Lend Lease was the builder. Spotless is the um, uh, service provider. Of course, the state government of Victoria made it happen. 
and uh, where uh, Benigo Health are the uh, tenants, beneficiaries and uh, uh, service provider. Next slide, thanks. Um, so the, why does the PPP work for us? Well, it was a competitive tendering uh, process for the project. So we reckon we got really good value. Um, we did put uh, um, the tenderers under some intense um, uh, scrutiny to make the selection ultimately. I'll touch on that a little more in a moment. Um, but the project was delivered on time and on budget. And for any project of this complexity and this size, that is a fantastic um, outcome. And I have absolutely no doubt that the PPP nature of the project contributed to that. Uh, it gave us increased certainty as the operator in relation to whole of life maintenance of, and management of the non-clinical assets. So our hospital today, five years down the track, looks as new as it did um, uh, when it was delivered to us. Um, it has clear and delineated performance outputs and outcomes to support our clinical services. <clears throat> and it provides uh, community uh, benefit, not only in terms of a, a really great world-class health facility, but also in terms of commercial opportunities that have come into our community. Um, it uh, did provide a reduction in capital project staging and our experience of these projects being delivered by other methods apart from PPPs is that they are so often done in stages. So, you know, you get the ED done as the first stage and then the cancer centre might be done a few years down the track. and so forth but um, from our point of view that was all reduced and it was delivered in the two um, two stages full um, full delivery and we got some great technological benefits and some innovations which um, I'd happily talk about but time will be against us um, to go into too much detail about uh, those things next slide thank you um, the engagement process, we, as I said, we went through a, um, we put the tenders through a, tenderers through a bit of a rigorous process. We had an interactive tender process with the two shortlisted tenderers, and we really did work very, very hard over many months with those to help them refine their design and their proposal uh, for final selection. And our staff, um, uh, hundreds of staff were involved in that process. We had a very detailed functional brief, uh, which was prepared by our um, clinical and management leaders. We revised all of our models of care and reflected those models of care in the functional briefing process. Uh, we had some great um, architects, the health design firm of Silver Thomas Handley did a great job with the internal um, artworks and uh, health design layout and the uh, facade and some of the um, uh, uh, appearance, external appearance and the main atrium space were uh, developed by Bates Smart, who did a great job. We had lots of prototype rooms, so we really tested things out. Um, we did a lot of completion and transition planning. We did work to introduce a digital and then subsequently an electronic medical record as part of the, of the um, uh, process, but we did do a lot of targeted communication. We, we had um, dedicated website, newsletters, lots of talking head spots, um, uh, lots of community um, uh, uh, workshops, um, uh, town hall type events and so forth, and really targeted uh, our local community. And we did that jointly with um, uh, with the state, with Exemplar Health and with the builder at the time, Lend Lease. So it was a really engaging and interactive um, uh, process, not just of us, but with our community. Thanks, next slide. Um, with the move to the PPP environment, uh, because we took so many of our services, our soft services, not just the hard building management services, and um, transferred them to the private partner. Uh, we had um, uh, many staff who were 
uh, transferred from our employment to employment by uh, Spotless, who are the uh, FM partner. Um, and this was quite unprecedented in our experience and in Victoria's experience. All the staff kept their uh, entitlements under um, industrial awards. We had no industrial action and uh, we transitioned that uh, staff uh, on time uh, as expected. So, you know, never been done before, but uh, we managed to do it really successfully. And um, uh, many of those staff are still working for Spotless in our hospital today. Um, thanks, next slide. So in summary, it's been a really exciting project. Uh, the PPP has delivered us a fantastic capital product. The building that has been delivered is just fantastic. It is really fit for purpose. It supports great patient experience, great clinician experience. It has a really light, the brief in terms of light and open and um, uh, a tranquil environment was um, very much satisfied. Uh, we're one of these hospitals that has very, very few overhead pages. It's all done silently via technology. Um, every patient room has a view outside to either a courtyard or to um, the external landscape. It was built uh, on time and on budget, um, but uh, we did find that 90% of the perspiration was in the final 10% of the job. Um, which is so often the case, I think. And we're really delighted and have benefited so well from some uh, pandemic measures that were built into the design from the outset that have enabled us to uh, really manage um, our response to the COVID pandemic uh, very well. So a really future-proofed um, uh, uh, opportunity that was delivered through the project. So a great uh, project. I'm, um, there are a couple of uh, slides that um, we can just flick through. Um, Natalia, if you wouldn't mind. So th these are pictures from um, the construction, final days of construction. It's a great looking building. Um, it's great to work in. I feel so um, uh, privileged to have the opportunity. And you can see from this slide that it is quite a complex um, site. Uh, in the um, right-hand corner of the university buildings. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a great project, great outcome. Happy to take any questions or to wait for the panel. You're on mute, Natalia. Natalia, you're on mute. Um, thank you, Peter. It was excellent presentation, really. And um, I have to say the expectations that you set was very, very high. So it will be very interesting to hear how the uh, private sector uh, respond to those um, uh, requirements. And also what was interesting, and I think it's also contribute to the success of the project, that very efficient communication campaign that you integrated into the PPP project. I think this is something which is missing and also stakeholder consultation which leads us to the uh, um, the role of the government, the vision of the government, how the uh, generally PPP framework is organized. And I'm very, very pleased uh, to um, uh, invite Tony Michel to give us insights about the Australian PPP climate and uh, your position on uh, in, in your um, state of Victoria. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. And thank you everyone for um giving me the privilege of at least presenting to you. And I'd also like to thank the association and Natalia for the opportunity to actually be part of this panel today and to, um, and to present a project that, as Peter's mentioned, and I think with the introductions today, that we've all had a integral part in seeing come to life. And uh, it's a fantastic example of a very successful health PPP for us. But um, if I could perhaps just move to the first slide, um, I have been asked to perhaps give our colleagues in Europe a uh, bit of a quick background to the use of the PPP model here in Australia. It's been in, in use for a number of years now. It's at least 20 years old in terms of its uh, implementation in its 
a modern form. Of course, we have had earlier iterations of what some of you might call public-private partnerships, where we have the sort of boot, build, own, operate, and sort of transfer model previously. But if we are referring to the 3P PPP terminology that's largely accepted, we have a we have a national framework here in Australia that's um, as noted on this slide. It it helps us deliver projects and commercial transactions pretty consistently across the board. Um, the the part of Australia that we're obviously mostly based in, at least the um, Australian members of the panel, we have been very lucky here for about 20 years now, since 2001, um, we've had the opportunity to, to have the benefit of this particular procurement model um, being implemented. It's not used for every project, not surprisingly. It, uh, it does have particular benefits, which I'm sure many of you on this uh, webinar will be well and truly aware of and obviously interested for your own countries and your own organisations. Um, we've been to date 34 transactions have been implemented since 2001 um, and you can see some numbers there I've put in a euro to give you to give you some some idea of the actual volume that we've had implemented here so um, two of the larger ones this year obviously the new Footscray Hospital uh, which we won't talk about in any great detail today, but certainly our sort of largest single transaction that we've had in health, um, best part of 1 billion a euro to deliver that over the next 29 years. And we've had a very large road project uh, recently closed, North East Link, as you can see there, which is a very big undertaking for tunnelling, some of the longest tunnels in the world will be constructed as part of that project. Um, within the within the actual government role I have, we have six uh, operating PPP concessions. You'll see our oldest one there, Casey Hospital, is more than two thirds through its uh, sort of operational phase. So we are coming into that last part of the twenty five year term, which is actually quite common here in Australia for for the actual operating term of our of our hospital concessions. And Bendigo, which we're talking about today, is obviously our most recently commissioned uh, facility in 2018. We have one in construction and we have another one that's very near to having an appointment for a preferred bidder. And there might be some people on this call that are, that are potentially financing or are otherwise involved in that particular transaction. So I won't go into too much detail uh, about that. But fair to say we have a very solid uh, a pipeline of opportunity in Victoria and Bendigo for us has been one of our most successful hospital projects, largely because again of the people involved, which Peter mentioned earlier. Next slide, please, Natalia, if I could. Um, we do see for us here, we, uh, we have been through various phases of the implementation of the models and said over, over 20 years, we do find um, the vast majority of our projects are structured with government paying for the availability of the asset and, and the service. So we do have economic you know, PPP concessions where it is effectively user pays. We do find that mostly in the sort of toll road uh, sector, but in the space that we're in, social infrastructure, we typically describe them as the design, build, finance and operate concessions uh, or in hospitals for us in particular, it's design, build, finance and maintain. And in fact, all of the Victorian hospital PPPs, uh, we have the Victorian government or the actual Ministry of Health, like Peter's business, actually delivering the service for the actual clinical care. So patient services are all in, in, in all of our hospital PPPs still delivered by the government. And, and you'll see in the actual chat thread, Natalia, I have I have posted a summary table for all of the participants today that gives them hopefully some idea of the uh, of the services that are routinely included in most of the recent transactions. Peter's comments about Bendigo being the most extensive, absolutely the case. And if people look at the very centre of that table, they'll see mostly green, which would indicate that, um, that Claire and her team have the responsibility of delivering the vast majority of that uh, of that service and support for Bendigo. On this slide, of course, we uh, we do find that 
PPPs are not for all of our projects. And in fact, you'll see on the, on the very last dot point, it only accounts for about 10% on average of our total annual investment um, here. So the flip side of that, of course, is 90% of our projects aren't delivered this way, but we do find there's been very strong, consistent support across many years for this when we have a risk profile for a project where it's suited to the to the PPP model. Uh, next slide, please, Natalia. So why do we actually use the P3 model and how is it selected uh, for use? These two images here, the first one is, is a slightly different shot of the Bendigo uh, Hospital at night, obviously, or late evening. Um, and the one on the very bottom is the architectural design render for the actual new Footscray Hospital, which is a very large facility, larger than the Bendigo actual development. But principally, why do we use PPP within government? Um, we do find that of the 34 transactions, and in particular our hospital ones, we, we do always achieve a very tangible saving uh, in terms of dollars. Um, relative to if government had delivered the project itself directly. So for us, we describe it as a value for money outcome where, where the government and the taxpayer does actually receive good value or demonstrated value for money. And that is represented by typically a seven to 15% saving in the cost of the project if it was delivered like for like by the actual government agency. So the business I work for, if we were delivering it ourselves, we find for a hospital PPPs that it would be more expensive for us to deliver the same uh, particular project. We also find that we've had a very good track record with some excellent partners, including the team here from Exemplar Health, um, that we do find that the PPP framework and the risk allocation has for us consistently delivered our projects on time and, and effectively on budget. So every single hospital PPP that we have done in 20 years has delivered the, the actual asset and the outcome to the budget that was set with the transaction and the time, the actual date for completing has always been achieved. And in fact, this project was slightly early uh, with some good work from the various partners on, on the panel here. So uh, it was effectively one month early from memory clear and Peter, I'm sure we can pick that up. So um, very good all, all round team effort on that. We also find that the, that the model that you're all are very familiar with and, and are practitioners in, we do find that we do get very good design, um, in fact, world-class design outcomes. So couple of images here will obviously demonstrate some of that, but we do find that we get really good international expertise uh, brought to the table as part of these actual bidding teams. And we do find that we also get the choice of two or three designs from this type of process. Whereas if we were delivering this ourselves, we would normally appoint a single team and we would end up with actually one design. So we do get the benefit of not just world-class design, but we also get the benefit of choice for Peter and his team uh, at the hospital. Um, payments typically dependent, as I mentioned earlier, on the continued availability and meeting a very large number of KPIs. Peter, I think Cameron's um, quite familiar with some of them where the equipment does intersect with, uh, with the contract, but I think there's about two and a half thousand separate KPIs for Claire and the team in the project company to make sure that all of the various partners do, um, do achieve in, in terms of providing that service. And I think lastly, just that point again, that we do find that um, every single one of our experiences with this model of project delivery has, without exception, delivered a much better value for money outcome than we could ever possibly achieve. Uh, next slide, please, if I could. I think, Natalia, you were also keen for me to go into some detail about why, why did we choose this team? So I think this was a similar slide to Peter showing the composition 
you know, five very, very, very competent partners here coming together as the entire exemplar health consortia, at least at the principal, principal level. And I think I'm looking forward to hearing from a couple of the partners with the follow up to um, up to my slides. If I could go to the next slide, please. Peter had an image up which will come up next on my on my slide after this one, which did show that complexity of the campus that Peter has. So if you didn't pick it up from the last image, you'll see there is a very large road separating the actual uh, yellow buildings here. So that sort of dark gray on this slide is a four lane road, Peter, semi arterial road that's uh, got quite a traffic volume going up. So this hospital is located a, across two physical, two physically separate land parcels with a road that actually separates you know, one half of the campus from the other. Um, this slide though was really answering the question in part, why did we choose Exemplar Health? And one of the principal reasons is that they put a lot of effort into thinking about not just the core development, which is that larger sort of yellow building, but they thought about the long-term plan development opportunities, what would add value and what would return benefit to the actual local community. So I think, I think on some of the other presentations coming, there'll be some more detail about what the, uh, what the individual buildings here on this particular image show. But it's, it's fair to say in, in our experience, Natalia and, and colleagues, that we do find that PPP does deliver a lot of additional value that government probably wouldn't be thinking about as part of its core planning for this type of hospital site. So um, we do see some very innovative, you know, thinking commercially as well as the actual long-term benefit. I think Kirsten is certainly aware uh, from, from Zeman's perspective that uh, as the principal investor originally in the, in the, in the bid team with Lendlease, that we were, you know, very much grateful for this type of outcome where Bendigo Health and Bendigo Community do get the benefit of not just their hospital building as part of this transaction and that the, and that the actual consortia does look as a long-term partner uh, and being active on this site in, in terms of ensuring that they leave an actual legacy uh, for the users of this facility for many years to come. Next slide, please. This will give you, uh, this is straight from the bid documentation, Kirsten. So I think you'd recognize this was one of the uh, images that Peter also had on his slide. So uh, if you can just basically recall that yellow building, that very large one from the, uh, from the previous slide, you'll see that pretty much in the center of this particular image. But you'll also note as Peter indicated that there's a number of existing buildings that are in use on this site that sit outside of the PPP concession. So with the planning and the operational phase now, Claire and the team also have to be very mindful that they are responsible for a very large asset on a site, which is not exclusively within the actual PPP footprint, but the project company does deliver services beyond the actual new build component as well. So um, I think that's an important point to also acknowledge as part of this transaction. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, before we do go into the slide, I'd just like to make one final point. I think we also do see routinely these projects do take a number of years from concept design through to delivery. And that slide, as I had on the header, which will be available, I think, Natalia, I think the intention is to share these slides after the, after the presentation to the, uh, to the participants. But the actual, um, the actual year was 2012. So it was 2012 was the actual bid design. And if we go forward six years, we do routinely see what has been promised is actually what is delivered. I think again, that's one of the key benefits for the PPP framework that we do find very strong incentive and commitment from the project partners to actually make that outcome real that they have promised many years earlier. And I think that's one thing we don't routinely see out of government delivered projects because either people change and move on or organisations come and go involved in projects and you might not always see 
the same outcome that you start the planning process with, but we do in PPPs do see that quite routinely. This slide, Natalia, I think I was asked us to provide some nice confusion for some of our uh, some of our colleagues in Europe about how the actual contract is structured. So I won't go through every box on here, but suffice to say, this is a pretty pretty vanilla structure that many of you would probably recognise if you are. Uh, actively involved in these types of transactions where the blue and the red box are the principal contracted parties. And then the rest of the participants shown in the, in mostly the sort of non-coloured boxes are the regular types of participants that you do have. These ones are the ones specific to Bendigo. So this is the arrangement that we do have and did have during the actual design and construction phase. But um, there's probably nothing of any great surprise here, other than to note that the Victorian government um, initially asked for the full amount to be financed, Kirsten, from memory, in terms of the um, in terms of the actual construction cost. But then the government did choose to pay down some of the finance debt with a bullet uh, payment at completion of the actual uh, new asset bill. So when the main new asset was delivered, there was a payment made to reduce part of the debt financing, but not all, but allow enough to be retained to keep the to keep the model intact as it's currently contracted on this team. I think there's one more slide, two more slides, Natalia, from memory on here. This goes to the to the sort of six to eight year journey. I think a few people would find this if they are uh, researching the actual project online, there is a project summary published on the Victorian government website, it's publicly available. This is taken from that summary. It does show uh, in this case that the ministry that I work for did start back in 2010. And then it does take a reasonable journey to deliver uh, not just the front end bidding phase, but equally then the the actual design and construction. And in this case, this was a PPP that had two stages to it. I think that's another point of difference where um, for all of our six transactions, we've largely had single stage delivery, but Bendigo was slightly different because of the complexity with that, with that sort of split campus uh, arrangement where Peter had to keep the hospital operational, the existing hospital operational, um, whilst we were building the new one. We didn't have the capacity to effectively close or reduce the physical capacity of the existing hospital whilst we were seeing the actual new facility come online. I think there might be one more slide, Natalia, after this. Um, pretty good summary here of what were the challenges. Peter's touched on some of these, you know, some of the, some of the well-known outcomes as I said, I've posted into the actual um, I've posted into the actual chat for the participants the what we call the soft facilities management. And the only contrast we use the word soft for is we call the actual building management. You know, so if you're maintaining the asset, we call that hard FM in our in our sort of terminology. And anything that's not related to the building maintenance fits that category as soft. FM for us. Peter's also indicated it was absolutely the very largest uh, redevelopment that we've taken outside of a very large metropolitan city. Bendigo is one of our largest regional cities, but it's it's the very geographic centre of our state. It's about an hour and 40 minutes, Peter, depending on how fast you drive or how fast the train goes from Melbourne to um, to get to to get to Bendigo. You know, a couple of our challenges in that sense was being one of the largest building projects outside of our main metropolitan capital city. Um, it was hard to get local building contractors to provide a lot of the local employment and that economic benefit locally, because this was a very, very large building project that Bendigo had never seen the actual likes of. So, Partnering with Lendlease as part of the Exemplar Health team, absolutely brought that sort of worldwide expertise to the table. But in most cases, we um, 
we had to we we had a few challenges over the actual delivery period of ensuring that if we were using local trades that we were getting a very consistent product. I'm, I'm pleased to say that we ended up with a consistent product, but the uh, but the construction phase was a little challenging for our builder to be able to deliver that consistently. The other thing, of course, is having seven, 800 people suddenly move to Bendigo and put pressure on rental accommodation. So um, I think a few people ended up buying, Peter, and, and have stayed since the project. But um, I think having a large number of out of city people arrive for a three or four year project was also a little challenging finding them accommodation. I think at one point we were contemplating perhaps with the, with the actual consortium that we were um, likely to build a temporary accommodation village to ensure that we had the workforce uh, accommodated. Thankfully, we didn't need that. There were, most of our workers were able to find accommodation. Peter also very quickly mentioned that there were um, some challenges with the site. I think he did say about the gold mining history from the 1800s. So the 160 year history of the hospital was predated by a lot of, um, a lot of mining activity, which made for very interesting construction for Claire and, and, and the team where if you were working on un, un sort of documented ground, you might suddenly find yourself opening up a very old gold mine. Um, I think, Peter, we did find some gold on site, but um, it was very quickly taken by the builder and uh, went to offset the, the cost of construction. Um, we did transfer the staff, as Peter mentioned, and for me, I think the complexity was exceptionally well managed by Bendigo Health with the consortia of implementing their digital medical record. So we would typically not want to go through such a large change project which is implementing a completely new you know, patient record, as well as the actual new asset we'd normally, we would normally stage that to ensure that we didn't have too much, too much commissioning risk um, coming together at the same time. But Peter's team did an exceptionally good job of making sure that that project was successfully you know, commissioned and it supports the activity. I think that's it for me, Natalia. I'm happy to end take questions at the end with the rest of the panel. Thank you again for the opportunity uh, to you. at least present this project. Thank you, Tony. I think it was, you know, I'm, I'm afraid I'm repeating myself. This was an excellent presentation. <laughs> and uh, you confirm once again that how important value for money is. And I think this is also, I think, a critical, um, you know, prerequisite for a successful PPP project. And also Australia is very mature um, you know, enabling environment for PPPs in, in, in terms of having the uh, all the uh, um, you know uh, legal um, regulatory framework in place. But what was interesting that you said only ten percent is um, uh, uh, actually uh, implemented as a PPP modality, which is actually confirmed the global statistics. Only ten percent goes as a PPP, which is fine. Don't, not not every PPP project should be, uh, you know designed as a PPP, so 10% is good. And um, so let's now move to next speaker. And I'm happy to invite Kerstin Schmidt, who will present the uh, investor perspective, equity investor perspective on this project. Kerstin, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you already switch to the first slide, please? So this was the vision that the, the government um, had for Bendigo Hospital. Um, so the vision about Bendigo Hospital was about ensuring that regional Victorians got the same healthcare as their city counterparts. Um, and when you move to the second slide, I, I was thinking about when, when, I, when we prepared the presentation, I was thinking about what was our vision. So our clear vision as a consortium, and whenever I say we, by the way, it's always us as Siemens, as a, as a team, as a group, but also Lindley, Spotless, um, everybody as a, and Capella, everybody together as a team, I have to say. Um, so our joint vision from the start was that we want to, pre, to we have to deliver this on time and on budget. Um, and over time, we, however, delivered or, or um, developed, I have to say, a special spirit in, in this project because when we realized for how long actually Bendigo and Bendigo Health had been working for this hospital, 
waiting for this hospital and how clear the expectation already was how th this great new hospital has to, to look like, we realized that um, we even want to try to, to over achieve. Um, so we want, um, we knew that there were certain things um, Peter and, and also Tony would have loved to have at the hospital, but uh, didn't have the, the budget for. Um, one of the, one of which was, for example, the helipad. I'm not so sure how happy you are in the end with having a helipad, uh, looking at the cost side of things. But um, that was one thing where we realized, hey, we want to deliver also a helipad, even though it's not in the brief. And also, as Peter said, um, like the childcare center, um, we thought it would be great for, for people working at the hospital. Um, to, to bring their children actually to work, have a childcare facility there. So we found space on the, on the ground, uh, on the site for that. And we thought looking at the community that also a, hot, um, a hotel for patients and their families would actually make a great addition for, for Bendigo. And Peter and Tony were um, creative and flexible enough to find space also on site where we could put that um, hotel. So that was also not in the brief. Um, but we were happy to, to de deliver it um, on top of, of this complex um, brown build, uh, brownfield um, hospital. Um, so Peter and, and Tony already mentioned it was delivered on time, or actually it was already four weeks early, um, delivered it early. I think that doesn't happen too often in, in PPPs. And yeah, as the expectation was, it was delivered um, within budget. And um, <clears throat> when we think, Sorry. And what we wanted to make sure for this hospital also is uh, by meeting the staff, by meeting um, the team through all, through all these regular meetings, um, we, we realized that, hey, there is great personnel, great healthcare staff um, at, hospital, at the hospital in Bendigo. And we wanted to create a space where they love to come to work to every day and also where patients find a healing environment and um, being happy to be at a hospital is possibly the, the wrong word, but we wanted them to feel secure, safe, and yeah, make this hospital simply a, a very special place. Can you move to the to the next slide, please? And so um, Peter already had uh, things in his mind uh, what the hospital has to deliver for him, and and of key central importance was patient focused design so you wanted more single rooms than, than normally uh, in a public hospital in australia or in victoria you wanted um, a more spacious um, um, design and he wanted a healing environment and so we uh, looked together as a consortium again we looked worldwide at great hospital builds um, and tried to bring the best all, of all those together to to, to bendigo and one very important thing for us was natural light. So we wanted to flood simply the building and uh, every part of the building with natural light to make it really nice to work there and to, to be there as a, as a patient. Um, and also we wanted, uh, or we needed to deliver on, on the promise that this hospital would be future-proof. Um, we didn't plan on really uh, testing that within the first couple of years already in a COVID situation, but we wanted to make sure that if a PPP is there for 25 years, um, priority shifts um, appear from one department to another. So uh, we, we needed to find a design that is open for that. And we wanted it also to be able to include future technology innovations and so on. Uh, then another very important point was sustainability, uh, I think, all of us, especially also Lindley's, was very happy to deliver on that with solar panels, a green roof, and, and overall a very good, I believe, um, um, greenhouse gas footprint um, of the building, of the facilities. Then technology, uh, Cameron will also touch on that uh, in a minute, uh, but besides uh, what was already expected from us, I mean, we wanted to bring healthcare innovation to this hospital, and we wanted to be proud in the end. Um, to be also an investor of this hospital and, and a partner from a Siemens Healthineers perspective and an overall Siemens pr um, family perspective. Um, and one thing I believe that also only was in our uh, proposal was, for example, um, what's not there, the automated guided vehicles at that time, I think rather unique and a, and a really good idea to automate things and to um, yeah make sure that we actually only need uh, oh, that, that um, 
people working at the hospital can focus on the patient and not on transporting things from A to B. And lastly, economic benefit already, I think uh, Tony mentioned also the success he had in, in other PPPs, but also here we knew that we had to deliver um, very good value for money. Uh, maybe we even overachieved, we could have possibly also won with a little less value for money, I'm not sure, but um, I think it altogether is, uh, yeah, shows perfectly that a PPP really is a benefit to, to all the parties, to, to private and to the public. And uh, one more thing there we wanted to make sure, and we had to make sure that we create as many local jobs as, as possible with the problems that um, Peter and Tony also touched upon. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, and this is already my, my last slide. Um, I wanted to, to just go briefly again, like who's involved or who was involved in, in this project and starting on the top right, um, the customer, Bendio Health, uh, Peter and his team. What was really special for this project is when I also compare it to other projects that, that I've been working on, uh, Peter and his team, they had a very, very clear definition of what they wanted from the hospital. So I believe you have waited for so long, you had so much time to plan for this, uh, this new build to happen, uh, that actually uh, Peter and his team, they were involved in every single detail. And, I, and whenever I am at the hospital, when I'm, when I'm allowed to, to visit, hopefully after COVID also again, when you walk through the hospital, I think in every single area of the hospital, you see that it's exactly somebody thought it through and somebody is there. So there's no um, part of the hospital where you think, ah, this could have been actually done in a, in a better way. Maybe over time that will develop as well. Uh, there are always things to improve, but um, we found that with all the prototype rooms and so on, um, the customer yeah, had a very, very clear understanding what, what they wanted. And that helped us a lot to develop um, the hospital as a, as a consortium, as a team. And then um, the, the state government, um, Tony and his team, also they have such a vast um, experience on PPP. Uh, they, the, the contracts are there, um, it's very transparent, uh, and I think yeah, 2001 pages are very clear on who takes which risk, which risk, which makes it very, not easy as an investor, but it's a perfect position to be in as an investor, so there's no, not much guesswork or anything, um, you know, it ex exactly what our responsibilities are, and, and Claire, I think, uh, does a great job uh, to deliver on those and also her, her predecessors before, um, or predecessor before. So it's very clear, clearly written down. And at the same time, also as Peter said, um, I think we don't touch the contract uh, very often. Uh, I haven't looked at it since we invested, I have to say, <laughs> uh, because it's uh, when the foundation is clear, actually everybody can, can um, simply do their job and form this partnership together and deliver what is necessary to you to make this a success. Um, and then in the center um, down Lentlis and, and Capella and they were really and they are the, the center of the project so Lentlis as a builder and Capella also with the, the overall project lead for the project. Um, so they brought all the pieces together they had the vision also I have to say with uh, needing a hotel uh, for Bendigo and the childcare center and and also their engagement, I think, with the community together with, uh, with um, Bendigo Health was really key to make sure that everybody in the region really appreciates this new building. And as you saw in the pictures, it's city center, so it was very important that we don't mess with, with the local population and so on. And then um, Spotless uh, doing a great job for the facility management, soft and hard facility management, and also, as, as Peter mentioned, with tertiary services, so really um, working interactively with the patient, taking patients from A to B and so on. So that was, um, yeah, I think it was a first in this project to, to include all this. And um, whenever somebody goes to the hospital, I think for as a patient, it's, it seems um, almost seamless. I don't think that patients really realize which part of the stuff is, is um, exemplar health, spotless overall. So the private party and, and which is um, Bendigo Health. And then lastly, our role as, as Siemens, so Siemens Financial Services, um, we, um, we are a 50% investor in the project company, which is called Exemplar Health. Uh, we also um, were one of the mandated lead arrangers for the debt. And then Siemens Building Technologies, also part of the Siemens family, they are subcontractors to Lendlease for the build and, and also to Spotless. 
for maintenance and so on. And last but not least, Siemens Health Engineers with uh, the healthcare innovations that Cameron will also touch upon. Um, the major medical equipment was part of separate tenders outside of the PVP, but still um, health engineers played an integral role in really bringing healthcare innovation in, into the facility, into the hospital. And I think with questions, I think we will have that in the end, Natalia, right? Right. Thank you, Kerstin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think our audience already uh, understand why we have chosen this project because it's really uh, you know incredible from every point of view uh, delivering value for money uh, 200 million euro um, it's, it's incredible then it's a very strong uh, environmental uh, approach uh, value for people how much was done for the community it's incredible um, so I'm very happy now to move to technology part and Cameron, the, uh, over to you. Let's talk about value for innovation. Thanks Natalia, thanks, Natalia and, and thank you everybody for the opportunity. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. I want to touch on a few things that both Peter, that every, every speaker has actually touched on, which is around the partnership. One thing I will say that as a technology partner, it's not common where you walk into a hospital project are shown around and informed that the cranes have names. And some of those names will play us on words for some of the services like neurology, but this was part of the communication that Peter talked about um, to bring the community together. So if you think about the uh, health and ears business, we generally go in and deliver a CT or an MRI and uh, we hand it over and get on our way. But what happened in this project was that we were shown around, we were given the stories and the history, and we actually became part of the community. And I think that that's one of the most compelling elements of this whole, whole project and the technology delivery side just fits into that. Um, so through this presentation today, I just wanna to talk to you about what a technology partner can actually bring because it's really important to understand that to help deliver the outcomes that everybody's spoken about. So I was gonna describe that a little bit and then deep dive into the partnership. So um, if we can go to the next slide, please, Natalia. This slide gives the backbone of what we at Siemens call a value partnership. You'll hear terms such as managed equipment services or asset management services used in the, in the industry. Essentially it has um, six elements to it to deliver an optimised healthcare service to future-proof and look at expanding or advancing the services currently and over, over time throughout the journey of the project. So very briefly touching on them all, uh, it's not all about the technology because obviously we need the people and we need the process around that and I'll touch on some process because for those of you that know Siemens well, we, we love it um, and we use that to our um, benefit to provide some, some value. So the technology management essentially is all around device related topics and having one contact to manage the medical technology throughout its life cycle as, as Tony touched upon. Um, and this allows the clinical team and the other services to focus on the patient and the patient experience. That's really the intent of, of that element. Consulting and transformation along with the digital platforms um, that provide the data into the consulting and transformation is exactly that. It's working within the partnership to look at the efficiency and the orientation of the equipment and the medical tech. Again, for the time the project commences and right through the life cycle. And I'll talk a little bit about the forward planning as I go through the presentation. The knowledge access is all about research um, and all about sharing best practice, which this forum is a part of. It's about connecting people, but it's also about uh, delivering so, sorry, if we can just go back one, Natalia. Just, just back, just back to the, that's it. It's, the knowledge access is also about um, just uh, being able to, to bring certain, certain technology in at a time. So during COVID, we were able to run a little uh, research piece around COVID-19 and managing patients with, um, within that environment. At times we include operations management. So this is where we actually do place staff into, into the project. And you've heard a little bit about that spoken about digital platforms. I'm gonna commence with the design planning because I think this is one of the major parts of the Bendigo project that worked exceptionally well. And this was all about the patient experience and, and ensuring that the healthcare uh, team are able to deliver the services um, exceptionally. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Natalia. 
Natalia, if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. There we go. So this slide actually shows our pro, sorry, one back. So this slide actually demonstrates our process through a normal bidding phase for the technology. So you can see there at the front end, the bidding and the contracting and all the opportunity development bid preparation is all happening around the same time. Then you get to this uh, clarification of planning, the site development, the last calls, all these types of things around the manufacturing and the logistical delivering. We essentially in a value uh, in the Bendigo uh, project, what we did was we invested manpower and time and we just essentially took that part of the process and moved it forward two and a half, three years. And essentially all of a sudden from dealing with clinicians solely, our teams are now dealing with architectural firms like Silver, Thomas, Hanley, Lendlease. And from there, we can actually start to look at the site design development and actually use really innovative tools to, to, to plan the patient experience and healthcare, healthcare delivery. And we do this a really important part. We do this through the co-creation and working through the teams and the photos you saw um, from Peter's video with people sitting around tables is all important. If you can go to the next slide, please, uh, Natalia. Quite a number, a number of risks um, and opportunities are able to be realised through this this forward planning. Um, and essentially, the biggest opportunities really you can see you can see there's a lot of detail here, but it's designing the facility for an optimised patient experience, and actually able to ensure that uh, the healthcare service delivery is going to be optimal. It's going to be able to deliver for technology today and also to deliver for technology in the future. So some of the things that you really want to avoid and the opportunity exists in the value for money equation here is to ensure we don't landlock an MRI, for example, because it can get quite expensive come the swap out in 10, 12 years time over a 25 um, year, year project. So it's assuring, ensuring all the right services are available and, and placed in the appropriate real estate. So we don't want generators in, in patient areas, um, yet we still want the engineers to safely be able to operate and maintain um, what they need to do to keep things up and running. So we ensure that they're in the right locations. And quite a number of risks will be a, were able to be mitigated. So some of the big risks that we, we see that we're able to mitigate in normal projects, but able to be solved during uh, these types of partnerships are things like delivery of medical technology too early. So um, builders will generally have a KPI to deliver a floor and, a, and medical technology within, within a time frame. In this process and through a lot of dialogue, instead of delivering at the time frames allocated, we were able to work with everybody to actually predetermine times as close as possible to commissioning and, and startup to ensure that we didn't have things like warranty erosion. So for some of you that don't know, you don't want uh, your med tech sitting there for a year, the warranty has gone before you start using it because that increases your operational expenditure. So effectively the value for money we talk about, we really start to, um, to realize. If the equipment's there too early, the medical technology, there's a possibility of failure. Why? Generally high end technology doesn't like dust particles, doesn't like paint, doesn't like changing temperatures, condensation can change things. Um, so essentially uh, you avoid having to replace systems before they even get started and avoiding insurance costs. And then there's just general physical damage to the equipment if building works continue, continue around them. So we're able to actually plan around all of that. Another really important risk that can be mitigated is about the people and it's the safety risk. So um, for those of you who don't know, you don't really wanna have a pacemaker or have a pacemaker and be walking past an MRI, MRI machine that's not properly cordoned off or has an unlocked door. So all these elements of protecting the people, ensuring that um, ensuring the technology is able to be used on the day that, that the startup happens, we're all able to be mitigated and all go to the uh, value for money um, equation. If we move to the next slide, the mapping of the clinical pathways is quite interesting. This is a little video that did have some music, but I thought it was more relevant to the evening time slot than the uh, morning and afternoon time slot. So we saved you the uh, um, we saved you the pleasure of listening to it. But what you can, what you can see here is actually a demonstration of our planning of our patient movement throughout um, throughout the hospital. And effectively, what you've got here is you've got ambulant and non-ambulant patient movement. So where possible, clearly we're designing to try to avoid having a crossover if it's at all, all possible. 
making sure there's easy income and egress for patients, whether they're in or out patients, and therefore being able to serve the community. We can then go further and start to give uh, the health clinical professional team the ability to visualise actually what the project looks like. And there's many tools that we use within this project, but it really gives you um, a good concept of, of, of how that works. With all the planning, with all the uh, expertise, with the communication that I believe Claire's going to talk about shortly, we actually, um, if we go to the next slide, Natalia, and you can just go through the um, three steps of that slide. We're actually able to crane in an MRI. We've got people that are operating safely and uh, big smiles on, the, on their faces. So um, you'll all be pleased to know that all the technology was ready for that uh, early commencement date within the hospital, avoiding the risks and really recognising the opportunity. If we can go to the next slide, I want to do a little bit more of a deep dive into the technology management because that's the planning and the design pillar. If we move into the technology management side, next slide please. The first thing to say about this is that the technology management component just works around the um, uh, the objectives of the health services and the, and the project. So the slide prior to this one actually talked to the uh, Bendigo Health Services objectives. And, and the way we look at this is just making sure that we can provide our services and value to ensure that optimal service delivery is given to, to the patients. So what does technology management look like and what is a, an asset management to managed equipment service or a value partnership, what's that all about? Essentially, it's a medical technology-based partnership that manages technologies from cradle to cradle and through this 24, um, sorry, 25-year life cycle. It is outcome-based and it's a value-based approach. So what it does is it provides, if financed, some budget surety, and there are different models um, that are available, but we presented through this project budget surety through a fixed fee or unitary payment. Uh, it does transfer equipment related risks. So through all the KPIs, the most simplest one I can communicate would be a 98% uptime. So if the equipment is below 98%, there will actually be some abatements paid on that in some way, shape or form back into the hospital. Uh, it allows a focus on patient centric services and single point of contact, which I touched upon um, earlier. Really important point here, um, not one supplier is gonna be able to deliver all of your equipment. And as you heard from Kirsten and others, there is a, uh, a very open tender process for all of this. So clinical choice through any technology uh, management, value partnership, managed equipment services um, is vendor neutral. And then there's a continuous improvement and performance management regime around that that occurs through the partnership. If we go to the next slide, I just wanted to share a little bit about the, um, uh, of how the financial element looked like on this, well, oh, sorry. That's the one. So this is the technology roadmap we speak about. So we sit around the table and we actually outlined in this instance was 96 medical technology assets. And over the journey of the 25 years, you'll see planned for equipment replacements. You'll see some potential upgrades. You'll even see at the end of the project, essentially what the uh, buyback would be if necessary, if the project didn't continue in the same, in the same vein. It doesn't always have to be replacements, it's upgrades, but it's a really good visual to and any new project be able to spread out lumps of equipment if you need and look at different um, life cycles to try to manage the cost going, going forward. Um, if we go to the next, next slide, please. Once we've, once we've co-created the technology roadmap, what we essentially do is look at how the uh, financing of that can come about. So this was the proposal that was put forward um, back in June of 17. The dark blue line is essentially the mapping of the traditional capital expenditure when technology would come in and out of um, need, along with maintenance contracts. So you can see that that's quite a bit lumpy and that's through normal process um, of healthcare um, operators needing to get money by through governments or treasury. What we proposed was a uh, managed equipment service, which was a unitary payment, which is that bright orange line that you can see in between the four and the six million number. And interestingly, if you were to average out the peaks and troughs of that dark blue line, the managed equipment service actually equals ever so slightly below that 20 year average if you were flattening out that, um, that, that dark blue peak and trough line. 
And that really speaks to the value for money. So we're getting all this additional value at the same cost of what it would traditionally be to buy medical technology. And I think that that's what the partnership brings when you're talking about some of the financial aspects in this space. There was a discussion in the co-creation that we had was if we needed more capital in the project for um, any, any reason, what would that, that look like? So the um, straight blue line at the top, standalone, that you can see there, that essentially is actually a technology partner buying back equipment and actually refinancing back into the project so that uh, investment can be made elsewhere if there was any other needs at that particular point in time. If we can go to the next slide, please, Natalia. So I'm gonna to just touch on consulting and digital platforms because with the technology, it's important to make evidence-based decisions. And if we can move on to the next slide. Effectively, this is how we go about it. We have a technology backbone, which is all about digital systems and, and if you like, uh, business intelligent uh, tools that enables us to look at things like the uptime of the equipment, the utilization of the equipment, whether it's actually turned on or off and actually taking other information. So we're able to see a full end-to-end uh, -end health service and, and measure where, where we can see optimization efficiencies or whether we're happy with what we've got. And then that allows us to plug that back into the medical devices, which are either acquiring data or being used for other purposes um, and just better understanding life cycle for asset optimization and asset planning. We can run training programs around that depending on usage or new services that are coming on board. If we go to the next slide, please. From that, what we're able to do is start to actually really plan with evidence-based decision-making. So this is an example. We're still obviously uh, on the journey, which I'll talk about in a moment in, in this solution. But essentially what you can see here is you can see a number of general x-ray rooms, which essentially in Australia, after 10 years, if you're doing them from outpatients, the Medicare funding ceases. Um, so generally most people swap out at 10 years, different if you're delivering public health services. Um, mid-range 12 years, 14 years if it's low utilisation, which is a pretty crude way of deciding whether you're going to change out your technology. So what we're able to do in this whole model is look at the number of examinations occurring and you can see there in the light blue actually the year-on-year -year growth of the services and the potential of growth. And then what we look at doing is focusing on best practice. We, in this instance, we looked at the Canadian recommendations for technology. Um, and we were able to ascertain that a couple of systems through this data are, are, are of high usage and should be replaced at 10 years. And essentially the others uh, are at mid or low. And therefore in the plan, we plan some for 10 years and others for 14 years. It's not, we need everything at, at 10 years. And you have those discussions and communicate. So that's essentially how we go, go about the asset optimization. I do want to be clear, we're still on a journey with Bendigo on that, and Peter may talk to, to that a little bit more about the lessons, um, lessons learned. Uh, so this is an example um, of a data set, uh, but part of our proposal that we made. If we can go to the next slide. I just wanted to say the journey continues. So it doesn't really um, stop at any point in time. And, one of the things that we learned was the stakeholder engagement right at the front end, um, back in probably 2011, 12, when this was all being discussed, managed equipment services were new to Australia. Uh, so we, we, we weren't in there early enough, and we may talk about that later, but we were privileged to, through the partnership, be afforded an opportunity to um, present a proposal. You've just seen that, and, um, and the relationship and the benefits are coming from that, regardless of um, where we, we are as a collective moving that forward. So thanks, um, thanks Natalia for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Cameron. And I think, again, our audience realize how complex um, the uh, technology, uh, technological solutions are. So how much work behind and uh, a lot of planning, a lot of 
uh, education is required. And uh, Metec is, uh, you know, with, uh, with time, the, uh, the share of Metec is increasing and becoming more and more important in the hospital because without them, they can't be operational. So now I'm very happy to um, move to our last speaker today, who is um, uh, Claire Schill. CEO of Exemplar Health, and she will be talking about, let's say, the helicopter view of the uh, uh, main contractor, how the project was implemented. The floor is yours, Claire. Thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, great presentation. We've got everyone's uh, view, which is quite un unusual, you know, to have representation from um, uh, from all sides of the project, which I think is is excellent. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I think we've gone over this one uh, quite a bit in everyone's presentation. So uh, as you can see, um, we have had a, a Aware Super um, as just rebranded. So uh, that was originally um, uh, First State Super, who's been with the project. Um, so if everyone's uh, working out who that is from, uh, from the project consortium. Next slide, please. So we briefly touched on uh, the other speakers that touched on the services provided at uh, at Bendigo, and as you can see, quite extensive um, hard and soft FM services. Uh, so from help desk uh, through to uh, cleaning and portering, which are probably two of the most um, resource intensive services that we provide, um, through to security services, uh, and that's a you know really really important um, part of uh, of the delivery in particularly like ED and psychiatry um, and through to, you know, waste management, grounds and gardens and materials distribution. And particularly with materials distribution, the automated guided vehicles, the AGVs are, um, are particularly important and have been a great innovation in that regard. The innovation around um, technology usage has been um, really specifically designed to reduce injury, um, repetitive strain uh, and uh, lifting injuries and things of that nature, um, as well as, um, as others have spoken about, making sure that the clinical focus can be on the patient and the um, very, very patient-centred approach to all of the services that we do rather than um, all of the ancillary type um, services that go to support that clinical operations. Um, and the commercial tenancies, as we've talked about, um, I think one thing that people haven't touched on previously is our affordable patient and carer accommodation. Uh, and that um, has been a partnership with um, both corporate um, uh, and uh, community-based organisations in uh, in Bendigo and uh, more broadly um, to provide uh, really low-cost accommodation, accommodation from sort of $20 a night, which is effectively a home away from home um, for patients and their carers that is in the precinct right next to the hospital. Um, and so it allows them to focus on their treatment. And, um, and we've got our, uh, you know, Bendigo Bank is one of the, the major uh, contributors to that, but Spotless also in the provision of cleaning and, and some linen providers, Gouge Linen, and Bendigo Health and Exemplar Health and continuing to provide those services over the long term. And I think that that's been a really great initiative and enabled a lot of people who travel very, very vast dis distances because Bendigo Health provides um, services to uh, people right up to the border of and beyond of New South Wales. Uh, so very, very big distances. And so traveling for treatment can be difficult sometimes. Uh, the next slide, please. So we're now in the operations phase of the PPP in year four of the operations going into year five in January next year. So as you can imagine, there's really embedded and strong practice, really, really good operational interface. But we always do um, need to be mindful of the opportunities to refine and um, continue to collaborate on 
um, how we can make those services uh, more efficient or improve or respond to best practice. And the project agreement provides mechanisms by which we can do that, but it's really the communication and the operational interface that allows that to happen in a targeted um, and a, a very, I guess, culturally embedded way uh, amongst both of the um, organisations that work together. So um, that includes, you know, having regular meetings about what's happening, working out how we can um, better address some of the operational uh, issues that might occur as a result of, say, individual events or themes that might be picked up uh, in terms of um, how patients were um, receiving care. Sometimes, you know, they receive really excellent care and we want to um, really replicate that in a systemic way. And um, that doesn't always translate from a services specification uh, request, but it might be through practice and um, integration of operations and the services that we provide. Um, I think that there's a really, really strong culture of making sure that it's best care for every patient and excellent care flows through every element of the work that's being done, whether that's through a Bendigo Health um, staff member or through a, a spotless and exemplar health consortium uh, member, we look to make sure that, uh, you know, that is at the forefront of everything that we do. Um, in, in terms of um, designing and responding to, you know, future um, needs, including things like a pandemic, uh, there, there have been um, some specific elements that were included in the Bendigo Hospital design, and, and they've proved very, very handy, uh, such as, you know, negative pressure rooms, um, pandemic modes in things like HVAC systems. Um, so that's where it, it can maximise, you know, that outdoor air and ventilation to improve the air exchanges um, in spaces and um, having surge capacity. So one of the um, things that Bendigo has experienced is um, at times, uh, particularly when there is a, a, a range of exposure sites in the region or where Melbourne was, um, you know, experiencing a surge in cases, you know, Bendigo was part and parcel of the solution to being able to provide care to all people. And so they required surge capacity to uh, ramp up and then ramp down. Uh, and the hospital had that capacity already done and built. Rather than having just shelves available, um, there was um, good capacity for them to meet their operational requirements. Um, one of the things that has been really uh, important and integral, I think, to the success um, of, uh, of that really um, tight-knit operational interface has been the interface plans. And, and these plans are, are take the services specification and take the operational practice and provide a level of detail for the people um, who are undertaking those services every day, the cleaners, the porters, um, the help desk operators and the clinicians and talks about expectations within those services specification and how they might be operationalized on a day-to-day -day basis and where there's an interface between that operations um, how they might go about doing those things. And so it ensures that there is an alignment of that services spec with the operational delivery. And because we have people involved here, we have um, often um, expectations that can sometimes need recalibrating and there are um, a, a multitude of ways in which people can engage in that process whether that's through uh, facilities management operations meetings or committees um, that deal with specific area um, requirements there are there is a mechanism for communicating um, where there might be issues or where there might be um, opportunities to resolve problems um, I guess the other, the other point that's really been a little bit unique for Bendigo, but I'm sure would be um, common if you're outside of a, a big city or metropolitan area is the resourcing can be a little bit of a challenge. And, um, but what that has done in Bendigo has provided an opportunity for really um, unique and innovative programs with community partners. So Spotless, for instance, has um, engaged with the local TAFE, but also um, with the local um, uh, business council and other sort of council and community uh, initiatives to tap into a workforce that perhaps 
didn't understand what the opportunities might be at the hospital for work working there um, and uh, worked out a way in which they could make sure that their recruitment practice wasn't um, uh, unintentionally biased towards the way in which these people might engage in, in the workforce. And so they could test their skills and test their um, ability to, um, uh, you know, whether or not they're suitable for these roles um, in a way that probably hadn't been done before. And so it meant that the diversity of the workforce was expanded and we uh, have more representatives from minority groups within a very, very diverse community of Bendigo working at the hospital. So Spotless has, uh, you know, around about sort of 400 staff um, and uh, increasingly they're targeting pilots to engage with um, areas of the community that are in their staffing profile, whether that be um, the local current community um, or other non-English speaking um, uh, community uh, members. Um, they're working out ways in which they can better represent roles um, that, uh, that people can uh, engage with at the hospital. Uh, next slide, please. So um, having a, a pandemic in the middle of a, a public-private partnership, um, you know, is, is always uh, going to um, challenge uh, some of the operational practices that might be in place. However, I think that what it's done is it's provided um, a really good opportunity for us to really test that partnership in the PPP. And um, this just provides some of the impacts um, with regards to how uh, changes um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic um, have impacted the hospital. So we know that you know, hospital access was severely limited and that impacted both our commercial and also um, operational practices. Uh, the hospital became a COVID streaming hospital and with that came with it um, a whole series of additional requirements uh, that we needed to support Bendigo Health in. Um, the operator Bendigo Health, with, with our support at times, um, stood up four separate testing sites uh, at over 18 months. And then um, they grew and they shrank and, uh, you know, they popped up and then they closed down, those types of things. So it was very reactive to what was happening in the community with regards to COVID numbers, exposure sites. And they were often, um, you know, very resource intensive. Um, and at one stage, you know, um, traffic management and um, uh, pathology uh, runs to for portering and, and all of that needed to be uh, really kind of very, very flexibly um, operated to ensure that Bendigo Health could provide the services to its community that it needed to do. Um, so just an example of just some of the, the, the numbers. So 200 odd thousand uh, PCR tests were performed and over 543,000 service requests. Now, they're just service requests that come through our, what we call our QFM system. It's better. It's basically our job management system. And that's in addition to all of the other embedded services where people just get tapped on the shoulder to do jobs. So it's a very significant number of, of um job requests that go through to support all of those services that we talked about earlier. Um, and as we'll talk about in the coming slides, you know, the rules can change from a variety of sources. So they might be federal rules changing, um, state and then local operator rules, including things like councils and the like. Um, so we have to be very agile in terms of where we are responding and supporting Bendigo Health. And that's why that um, really strong communication between the two um, partners is, is very important. Uh, next slide, please. So there are some specific Im impacts that we have um, focused on here. And so those changing mandates and operational practice, I think is, is an obvious one, um, but things like the hospital status changing as I talked to before. So the hospital went from, um, you know, it's a tertiary hospital, but providing uh, COVID streaming services. So they were providing services to um, COVID positive patients and taking um, services from potentially other hospitals in addition to local um, uh, COVID cases. And, and that meant that um, there was reconfiguration of spaces, changes to functional spaces and um, changes to PPE, what um, uh, 
certain areas would be required to wear, including for our cleaning and portering staff if they entered hot zones and the like. And so it was pretty much, uh, and it still is, it remains a really live point of discussion um, to, to manage all of those requirements. Um, what we found is that at times they can be a little bit difficult to um, source authoritative advice, particularly when we have to provide that advice to third parties like our commercial tenants. Um, so the operations of the hospital will always take precedence over anything else. And that's certainly built into the way in which we lease our spaces. There's, a, there's an acknowledgement that the hospital and the clinical requirements of, of their operations are what is um, the focus. And so if that means, for instance, that um, visitors are no longer able to um, attend the hospital except under extreme um, or, or under exemption, then they need to respond to that accordingly. And so um, making sure that we've got authoritative advice is important, whether that's from the operator or taking the advice from, in, in many instances, from state government where they were initiating lockdowns and other restrictions such as mask requirements for um, visitors or outdoor areas, retail spaces and the like. Um, and as we know, changes really need to be immediate and um, require quick action. So uh, all of the um, facility um, uh, managers and uh, any of the administrative practice needs to understand that those uh, changes need to be put in place uh, you know, as soon as humanly possible. And sometimes that can mean getting additional resources in to support Bendigo Health. Um, so, so we've worked you know, really, really closely with, um, with Bendigo Health to understand what it is that they need so that we can then respond uh, with um, you know, a surge workforce as necessary um, to support them in, in the changes that they put in place. Um, we know that whilst the hospital was future-proof, there are still um, areas that do require some adjustments. And so um, we've had a number of modifications that have been put in place and some are temporary and some are a little bit more permanent. So there has been some changes uh, through initiatives that have been run from the Department of Health in uh, you know, a more centralised um, system of, of testing whether or not HVAC systems need to be adjusted, but also um, providing general guidance around cleaning regimes. And uh, we know that um, you know, staff amenities and, and um, in particular have been uh, sources of um, of risk in the past. And so um, Bendigo Health has been working really actively with us to ensure that the existing infrastructure, things like capacity limits are really clearly signed and um, where we can provide some additional amenities, particularly encouraging people to have their breaks outside. Um, you know, we're providing some support for some additional amenities there, making sure there's adequate shade um, and adequate um, uh, waste receptacles and things like that. Um, building access has been very, very important to define uh, through QR codes and the screening protocols that Bendigo Health is required um, under legislation to undertake. So knowing who is in the hospital at all times or who is in uh, various facilities at all times has been very important, particularly in um, peak times where uh, contact tracing has been an important tool to manage um, COVID spread. So ensuring that we can support um, Bendigo Health in those areas, uh, locking down electronic access, um, things of that nature. Bendigo, as you probably um, saw in some of the photos, is a very spread out um, campus and has a lot of entry points. And all of those had to be thought through in terms of who could access various points. Sometimes it was just staff and other times it was staff and visitors. And all of that had to, could be adjusted um, very, you know, relatively easily through um, their building management system, which was, uh, you know, a, a, a much easier way than going through logs and adjusting individual passes. Um, as we talked about, um, staffing and resources, you know, has, is, is particularly, um, I think, unique in regional uh, locations and I think that making sure that um, that we can 
support staff, reassure staff, um, but also give them really good advice with regards to PPE requirements is important. Um, and I think managing COVID exposures, um, I think is, is important for clinical perspective, um, but we've got to understand that there's a whole range of people who don't have a clinical background who are working in clinical spaces and they need to be supported a little bit differently. And so, you know, managing those impacts of COVID exposure is, um, is, has been a really strong focus. Uh, and obviously managing the commercial tenancies because they are you know, third parties to these agreements but have a really, really important role to play. So we know that um, you know, having them sustainable for the long term is, is going to be um, really, really important. So as a project co, we do that through um, providing uh, you know, relief and, um, uh, and, and other kind of supports to ensure that when COVID um, actually starts to come out the other side, that they're in a sustainable position to continue the services that they've provided throughout. Um, just the next slide, please. Um, and so really, uh, this is just a, a quick update to say, um, you know, it is about values. It's very much about communication and it's very much about planning for those impacts and managing that operational interface. The, the communication has to be, uh, uh, I guess, at every level. Uh, we've taken a risk-based approach to planning for the impacts. So really communicating about what those specific impacts would be if there was, say, 25% of staff that weren't able to attend the workplace um, and, uh, you know, right up to 75% of staff. So does it mean that bins would um, in certain areas be emptied, you know, less frequently and is Bendigo Health comfortable with that? At each and every level, we make sure that um, we, we know what would happen should the next step escalate upwards. Bendigo Health has really good pandemic planning for its own workforce and we made sure that we were really engaged in that process as well and we understood what they would be doing should um, the COVID pandemic continue to escalate through the various phases and, and you know that communication um, happens really regularly they're not static documents they're really dynamic and they change um, according to uh, what's happening on in happening in the broader environment. Um, I think probably one of the differences at Bendigo than perhaps some other projects is that we de definitely have a solutions mindset. You know, how do we resolve issues together? And I think communicating that throughout the process has been uh, really integral into the success of making sure that um, you know we don't have to pick up the contract every day and um, and talk about you know who's not doing what clause because we we live and breathe. Um, and thinking about what the operational impact might be if we were to do uh, one thing or another and how it would impact the other parties. And we discuss you know, how, how we might do it better. And I think that that's been really important. We document those changes. Um, and particularly, I think where, where during COVID, um, there have been lots of um, small changes and we need to make sure that those changes um, uh, continue to be checked in on and do Bendigo Health require them for a little bit longer term and we can manage then the impact of those things. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is some lessons learned, but we might come back to that a little bit later. So if there's, um, we can probably go to, uh, to the next one. So that's the beautiful Bendigo Hospital. I think it's a fairly common picture that um, we see um, representing uh, the new facility there. Um, and, and you can see it is very much built in and amongst the community of Bendigo. They're really, um, they really are our close neighbours. Uh, Claire, you're finished, right? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, just a little thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, then, um, yeah, I mean, it's a really incredible project. And first of all, I would like to compliment all of you for your professionalism for making this project success. And I remember when we were <laughs> preparing this workshop, we had a discussion just trying to brainstorm between ourselves why this project is so successful. And we come up with three Ps. If you remember, Tony, <laughs> which was your formula, 
is the uh, people, professionalism, and spirit of partnership. And I think this is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, how competent the uh, uh, partners are, what experience they have, um, what is the level of flexibility, agility to, to be able to accept uh, changes and, um, you know, to communicate with other partners. And of course, it's all about people. So big compliments to you. But, you know, ne nevertheless, the, the picture even it looks perfect. I think there is always room for development. And I think that for our audience would be also interested to know what you, looking back at the project, what you could have done differently. And uh, I would invite the um, uh, speakers in the order of appearance maybe to share their views and uh, what you would have done differently, Peter. Yeah, thanks. Um, and Natalia, I think from our point of view, um, uh, sort of medical technology and ICT, and Cameron touched on this a little earlier, um, we'd probably like to have seen more of that into the whole of life management cycle of the PPP. Um, uh, in Victoria, the government hasn't had a high appetite for inclusion of uh, technological uh, heavy components into um, uh, the whole of life cycle management of the PPP, um, due in part, I guess, to technology risk, the changes in risk and so forth. But from our point of view, particularly ICT and medical technology is so intrinsically uh, connected today. You can't have a medical device without an ICT system and framework. Uh, all of our medical records are electronic now. So computers are integral to the care component, just like the building is integral to our uh, to our treatment and care. So I think, you know, if I could change anything, it would be that. Um, uh, we've got a, uh, uh, secondly, we've got a few uh, retained buildings that are still unredeveloped and we would have loved to have had them all uh, fixed up at the uh, same time. But, um, uh, you know, I've got to uh, extend great um, uh, compliments and thanks to the government for the support that they have given to our community. Uh, as Tony outlined, this was kind of a, an eight-year project from uh, inception to here. There's probably a previous eight years or more of lobbying and um, uh, asking and begging government to do something. So from Bendigo's point of view and from the community's point of view, it's probably closer to a 20-year project. But it would have been nice to finalise all of the retained um, buildings and to have had... Um, uh, the uh, project uh, company pick those up um, as, uh, as part of the PPP. Um, and like any health service, I'd be failing if I didn't say it would have been great to have a bigger budget and to have done more things and, and uh, uh, put in more technology and more innovation. Um, ultimately, all um, uh, capital projects are built to a budget we got great value for money from our point of view. Um, it's a, uh, as I think we've hopefully conveyed, it's a great facility. And um, uh, it's uh, nine, nine what, what time is it? Almost 10 o'clock at night. I'm still here and still loving it. Well, thanks a lot. And uh, Tony, uh, would you like to, what you would done differently from a governmental point of view? Yeah, Natalia, I'd like to support what, what our friend Cameron's mentioned in his presentation, I think, uh, you know, the single thing I would change is I would make a managed equipment service pretty standard across all of our PPPs. And I think we routinely put the building asset in for the 25 or 30 year maintenance, but government rarely, in our experience here in Australia, chooses to automatically include the equipment that's loose or critical to the actual service being provided and I think to Peter's point he's just made and to Cameron's presentation that you know having that having that also taken care of so that Peter and his team the actual medical nursing allied health you know core clinical workforce can focus on their core job and not have to worry about managing 
the equipment and technology and the other bits that if it, you know, it, it should be routinely put into these deals. I don't get the choice to do that, but I think that's the one thing if I did have a choice, not just for Bendigo, I'd do that for all of our health PPPs and hopefully Cameron with a bit more advocacy that we can um, perhaps convince some of the politicians that we might be able to um, see the benefits from doing that. It's It certainly isn't just a cost. There is clearly a measurable benefit. That's why Peter and his organisation has been exploring this, you know, to try and take advantage of the fact that you do have competent delivery partners potentially a competent partner in the in the actual Zeeman's business here to do the MES for Bendigo. Um, it makes perfectly good sense, but we don't do it. The other thing I think I would perhaps change, um, Natalia is, and there was a there was an excellent question in the Q&As, which a few of us have been, you know, busily answering for the participants today, but there was a question there around, um, you know, on the actual 20 year or 25 year timeline, it's very hard to predict what growth in population we're going to have over that period of time. We would never have predicted in 2013 that COVID-19 was, was a issue or risk. Pandemic risk is known and it's, and it's sort of routinely thought about worldwide around different forms of pandemic, but probably not to the extent that we're seeing here. And I think when we when we lock in service and activity for support, that Peter has a has a profile of predictable long term trend. If that trend rate changes materially, the Ministry of Health and Peter's business doesn't have the budget cover for the for the sort of volume based service that it, that it actually needs support for. The building's taken care of. The PPP works fine. But we don't actually have the have the operational funding quarantined or available to suddenly sort of increase quite materially above what we might have modelled for the 25 year concession. So again, I think that's something that I would perhaps change to give a bit more flexibility, both to the project company Claire's organisation and Peter as the health service operator or the health service provider hospital operator actually having a bit more room to move with their with their with their actual contract budget so we get the certainty of price around the building and the support for the building i'd give them a bit more flexibility around peter can buy a bit more support if he needs it or if the project company does find that their long term assumptions are way off because of events like a global pandemic that we've got some opportunity to be able to reset or to or to manage it within the contract. It's not impossible, it's just harder for us at the moment to go and make the case for a sudden uplift for more money for Peter because he needs to treat more patients and to and there's lots of people moving to Bendigo. It's a wonderful part of Victoria. Um, anyone wants to move to Australia, Bendigo is a lovely place to live. So uh, we find most people are happy to move to a large regional city now because they can use things like Zoom and other tools to be able to, to work, not having to travel as much for work as they have in the past. So those are probably the two main things I would change uh, on this project. Thank you, Tony. Then um, we will move to Kerstin. Um, for my side, um, as an investor, I think what I what I realized uh, during the project, I think we could have even listened more to the customer. Um, so I think uh, being yeah really also as a yeah from a Siemens perspective, being even more involved on site, visiting the hospital and so on, I would have personally very much loved it. I have to say. And I think we could have done there better. We got very lucky with the partners, I have to say. So Lentley's covered that job amazingly well in, in Capella and, and Exemplar Health. Um, and so we got lucky, I think, in, in many parts to, to make this project such a success. And it's also, it's about the people and, and having Claire there uh, on a daily basis and the team to really make it happen so that we don't have to rely just on contracts and KPIs and so on. So. 
So I think 50% uh, we, we did a good job all together and 50% it's uh, really the, the amazing people who are continues to continue to be involved in the project. And the one thing I agree with Peter and Tony, um, I feel much better if also the equipment was taken care of. So if I could say, no matter what happens in the next 25 years, uh, it's not only a beautiful and nicely renovated, great, nice looking facility, uh, but, but also that all, everything actually would be taken care of. That would be also my lesson learned and takeaway. Thank you, Kirsten. Cameron? So I think mine's been said, Kirsten. Mine really was about earlier engagement and the advocacy as a partnership, which uh, Tony was talking about and Peter talked about, it can get a little difficult within the constraints of a active tender process and probity. So we need to be mindful of those aspects that makes it difficult. However, um, we're continuing the journey, as I said, with uh, the, 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 the team in this partnership. So I think um, hopefully we'll be able to give some positive news there in the future. The things that worked very, very well that I wouldn't change, but I think just were worth mentioning was this co-creation to deliver the outcomes for all the entities that we all aspire to. Um, I, I just don't think one organisation can bring in their own ideas and their own thoughts and, and really state this is the way it needs to be done because this is how we've seen it done. You've heard it from everybody. It just, just has to be done that way. And it was one of the best experiences I've had in my career was sitting around a table that, uh, of stakeholders that was made um, available to us by Peter and his team and the support there to actually have this discussion to pull it all together. Um, and I'm really glad the journey continues. I don't see it ending and I see a lot of the value that we've spoken about regardless of the contractual or not that is being delivered and I think we all win by that and, and the community does. So um, they're the things I would not change. Thank you, Cameron. And now, Claire, just to close everything what has said so far. <laughs> Thank you. Um, look, look, I think that um, it's it really is reinforcing what the others have said. One one of the things um, I, I think that was a great learning um, is that the design excellence, you know, quality infrastructure, great design, and a, a, a very um, knowledgeable partner in Bendigo Health in, in working out uh, what, how they wanted the um, facility to work. It, it, it'll only take the design so far, and that design then needs to be operationalized. And the operator really has to work hard, and, and Bendigo Health absolutely did work really hard to ensure that their organizational change was very effective because they went from very, very poor facilities to world-class facilities. And um, they needed to change their, their, the way in which they practice their operating model. And that takes commitment and that takes cultural change. And it does take a bit of time. So some of those um, uh, you know, changes don't happen on day one, but it's with persistence and education and really um, working with them to, to show the benefits of, of how the facility should operate. And Bendigo Health has been able to achieve some amazing results as a result. And, and, and it has allowed them to step up their services even further since we've, um, you know, commenced operations. And that has allowed those aspirations of the community to really be met um, and exceeded, I think, in, in many respects. Peter probably would agree that, you know, that they are very, very proud of the facility that's been created in Bendigo for their benefit. Um, and, and I think some people are, when they come there for the first time, it really does look um, like a world-class facility and it's operating as that. It's not just pretty, it actually functions amazingly. <laughs> Thanks a lot. 